Thank you, Nuala, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you here today. Um, as Nuala said, my name is Anne-Marie Dillon. I am a mead woman living in Loud. I feel the need to say that because Nuala has introduced everyone else by their county, so <laughs> I better get that one in. Um, so, as I say, my name is Anne-Marie Dillon. I'm the head of the Pesticide Control Division. So today I'd just like to um, outline the regulatory process. It might be old hat to some people in the room, but I think it's always good to understand what the uh, regulatory framework is behind the topics that we're talking about. And I'll have a little um, look to the future as well and see where things, things are going. So just in broad terms, when we talk about pesticides, um, there are two broad categories. Today we're talking mostly about, or all about plant pr um, protection products, but also just to mention that there is also biocides, which fits into the, to the, to the term pesticide. And that includes things like rodenticides, disinfectants, hand sanitizers, etc. So the regulatory framework, um, as Nuala mentioned, the Department of Agriculture is the competent authority for all regulations relating to, to pesticides in Ireland. And within the Department of Agriculture, the Pesticide Registration and Control Divisions have responsibility for these areas. There are four, four broad areas of uh, regulatory um, that, regulation that I'd like to talk to you today about. Um, the main one being the actual registration process for pesticides and, and the sustainable use of pesticides, which is, again has been mentioned here today. I'll touch briefly, just as a matter of interest, on the residues um, in food and feed and also on the classification and labelling. So from a regulation point of view, um, the uh, pesticides are regulated um, at European level under a particular regulation called uh, Regulation 1107 of 2009. And that basically regulates the, the placing on the market of plant protection products. Um, the active substances are, are approved at European level and the products are then um, authorised at member state level. So when I, when I talk about an active substance, we're talking, let's take the example again that was mentioned this morning. So Ah, there you go. And <laughs> chlorine is <laughs> um, uh, is the active substance, and in that case, corrigin is the plant protection product, or uh, the cypermetrin is the active substance, and the forester is the plant protection product. Just to give you an idea of. So at European level, then the active substances are um, evaluated by a rapporteur member state. So one member state takes on the role to evaluate all the scientific data produced by the chemical company. They then bring that um, to, the, to the European Food Safety Authority and there is a full peer review of all that scientific data, which is a, a very detailed process which takes, um, can take a number of years. For, at the end of that process then, the EFSA conclusion document is put forward to the Commission and it's at that point that the Commission bring forward a proposal and it's at that point that there is a vote at the Standing Committee and all Member States have a vote on that. So just to give you an outline of what's involved uh, from an active substance evaluation, what you're looking at there are things like analytical methods, physical chemical properties, um, toxicology from a mammalian <coughs> point of view, environmental faith and behaviour, ecotoxicology, uh, res uh, residue chemistry, and so on and so on. So you can just see the detail that, go that goes into that. Um, then at, at um, national level, the actual plant protection product, taking the information from the active substance data, is then approved or authorised or not um, at member state level. And within Europe, there are zonal systems. So we work within the central zone. So for example, we can mutually recognise uh, an evaluation coming from another country within that, within that zone. And we do that quite a lot, taking into account similar uh, um, situations. And somebody mentioned about the, you know, the off-label approval. So that's an example of an approval that we grant at national level. So they, and what we mean by an off-label approval is basically that we have fully evaluated all the, the toxicology, the environmental data, all the safety data, but we might not necessarily have all the efficacy data because the active substance um, is normally used maybe more in a horticultural setting. But that's where maybe data like the data, like the information that, that Chagas or Quilche have generated um, comes into play. And it's an off-label use, which means that the efficacy is at the, at the owner's risk rather than the company's. 
just by way of clarification. <coughs> so obviously this work has been going on at European level for, for a number of years. And, and we all talk about you know, the reduction of uh, active substance being available. And that has happened over a number of years where there's been review. And the review of active substance is constant. So under the regulation, an active substance is approved. And then after a period of time, um, that active substance is reviewed again. So in other words, you look at the new scientific data see where um, the science is at, and then the active substance is either approved or not um, again. And, and you'll, you'll know of, like for, for, you know, you'll know of active substances that we have, have lost, if you like, over the years due to their, their hazard um, um, characteristics. So then just to touch on, on those characteristics, um, and I mentioned uh, the, the classification and the labeling, and we are, you'll be all familiar with the symbols that we have on, on, the, uh, on the chemicals. But just to outline where that comes from, so there is a particular regulation and the classification is conducted from, by, um, at European level again by the um, European Chemicals Agencies. And that's what gives us those symbols. It also gives us the hazard-based um, criteria for the active substances and again feeds into whether active substances can be approved or not. And as I say, just to mention, it's not particularly relevant in, in this setting, but just to mention that we also have the regulation on residues so, um, to do with food and feed safety. So the Department of Agriculture is the competent authority for this. So basically we have an annual monitoring program where we um, analyze food and feed uh, for pesticide residues, and we would, if if there's residues beyond what's called the maximum residue levels, then there may be there may be issues, and we may need to to follow up on that. So then, just moving in, and it was mentioned again this morning on a number of occasions, um, the Sustainable Use Directive. And I suppose, from a legal point of view, this is where IPM fits in, and and the, stain the Sustainable Use was established to basically have an overarching um, regulatory framework to achieve this sustainable use. So we had the, we had the marketing, uh, we had the marketing and use, or the, sorry, the placing on the market regulations. We have the residues on the other side, but in the middle is the actual use, the everyday use of these products. And again, the sustainable use directive is all about ensuring that that is sustainable going forward and that the risk and impact for human health, the environment um, is minimized. And again, as I say, the promotion of integrated pest management to look at non-chemical um, alternatives, as we've talked about um, a lot today. So under the Sustainable Use Directive, each member state has a national action plan. And within, those, within that plan, there are five broad areas. And I'll just touch on them. And, and by all means, you can talk to me at lunchtime or whatever about some of the details. But so... Taking, uh, we'll start with the training and the education and advisor. And again, we talked about professional users. There's also um, particular training and particular uh, requirements for advisors and for professional users to have. So that, so somebody who is a professional user basically means that they're using a product that is deemed to be a professional product, which is is is. Um, You'll, you'll notice on the on the actual container it'll, or on the label it will tell you that a product is a professional use product. And there is particular training and particular requirements and a registration process for anybody involved in those particular areas. And then just moving down, I don't have my a cursor, but just to say on the, on the control of application equipment, so again, calibration, ensuring that equipment that's used is fit for purpose uh, and that certain application equipment has a requirement to be tested on, on, every, every number of years to ensure that it is, it is doing what, it, what it's supposed to do. Um, on the control of storage, supply and disposal, so basically any professional user who is storing chemicals has to meet certain criteria to ensure that they're, they're storing it correctly and safely. And, and that's important as well from a, a retail and a distributor point of view to ensure that there's no spillage, etc. Um, on the disposal of um, plant protection products, I, um, I think you might all be aware of the, the idea of the triple rinsing of a container. So basically that means that if you have a, a used a, a pesticide, the container can be, if you triple rinse that back into the sprayer, that then can be deemed, is not deemed to be hazardous waste. So it can be recycled in the normal way. If you have 
leftover um, pesticides for, for whatever reason can't be used, then that must be disposed of as hazardous waste. Um, the control in particular areas and the protection of water is obviously something that's very important uh, in our daily use or whenever of, of plant protection products. And the Sustainable Use Directive does um, include um, the need to ensure that we um, take certain measures. And for example, if we talk about uh, special areas, so somewhere where, the, and this would be relevant to some of the forestry colleagues, where there's public, where public where people basically hang out, um, there are certain requirements. And again, that's, that's an important um, aspect to be aware of um, if, if you are involved in that area. And the protection of water goes without saying. And a part of the regulation or the um, approval or not of an active substance or a product um, includes a detailed assessment of the risks from a water point of view and may include the need for a particular buffer zone um, where there is water. And again, that is on the label of a, of, a, of a product. So if it says there's a buffer zone of two meters, it's there for a reason and, and it needs to be, it needs to be uh, included. Um, IPM then, obviously, it's an integral part of the Sustainable Use Directive. And it really is, it's the, it's the key word, if you like, keywords, and it will be as we move forward. Um, I don't need to go into it in any, any detail, it's been discussed, but just to say that it is, it is in legislation, it is a requirement that a professional user has to apply the principles of integrated pest management, in whatever format that is, and to record those um, decision-making um, um, processes. So then just looking again to the future, and I mentioned that, um, you, you know, over the years, the review of active substances has reduced the number of uh, available um, plant protection products, and, and that continues to be to be a trend. Um, I think we, we definitely, there's about 900 pesticides have been removed uh, over, over a number of years. I think we're about, about 450 or thereabouts uh, registered active substance at European level. So going forward, um, the Sustainable Use Directive, as part of the overarching um, farm to fork strategy at European level, there is a, a target. And the target within that strategy is to have a 50% reduction in the overall use uh, of um, chemical pesticides and a, a reduction in the more hazardous um, hazardous pesticides. That's there in a strategy. It's not in legislation yet, but one of the mechanisms where we may see it coming into, um, into legislation is under a, a sustainable use regulation. So that regulation will replace in time the sustainable use directive that we currently have. We haven't seen that yet. The Commission are in the process of drafting that. We're expecting it in June this year. But they, that will put together the framework, the legal requirements. And it will include, we don't, we don't know yet but the detail, but it will include additional requirements in the whole area of IPM, um, et cetera. And it's something we, we, will be, we will be looking at. The other thing just to mention again, and I think Louise mentioned and others mentioned, the biological controls. So under the, under the um, Farm to Fork strategy, the Commission have been asked to do some work on this and to look at options from a regulation point of view of how we actually could put together a, a, a clear, useful um, regulatory process to allow these type of plant protection products, which they would be, um, to be regulated. So in other words, that they wouldn't have the same criteria as um, chemical pesticides, but they would still have to go through the rigours of, of the scientific review. So that work is ongoing um, at, at, at a European level, and we may see something coming down the line from a regulatory point of view. And I just mentioned in passing the biodiversity strategy. So all these strategies link in to that whole idea of reduction of um, risk um, from, from a pesticide point of view. And again, that's something that is important from, from our point of view to consider, and particularly when we're talking about IPM, that obviously we're doing it from a management, a pest management point of view, but that it may become something that we, we need to look at in more detail. And, and again, as pesticide, chemical pesticides um, become less available, then obviously that whole area is, is, is very, very important. 
Um, that was a little bit of a whistle stop, but I think some of the, some people may have specific questions, which I'm happy to take over over lunch or now, whichever you prefer. Um, and I'm happy to discuss any other any other points during the panel discussion. Okay, thanks very much for that. Very very interesting, and I suppose. Um, to a certain extent, charts a bit of a way forward to, you know, people's approach to uh, pest control, I suppose. Um, just in relation to forestry, I suppose there's always the issue that, and, you know, off-label approval maybe supports some of that, that um, the range of pesticides available to us tends to be quite limited. And because of, I suppose, here in Ireland, the scale of forestry compared, to, and when you look at having to reduce by 50% use and 50% um, uh, of, I suppose, dangerous chemicals or potentially dangerous chemicals. Like, where do you see uh, forestry fitting in to that in relation to the use of chemicals into the future? Yeah, I think, you know, I suppose there are other... Ireland, by its nature, we're a small country, but there are small areas within that from a from a pesticide point of view. So some areas in um, you know in horticulture are small niche areas, and and you know we've always been proactive in looking at or helping to to get the type of products um, to, uh, regulated and to, to make and to have them available. So ultimately, it is a um, it's the chemical companies. Um, decision whether they go to market with a particular um, chemical product and, um, and and obviously they apply then f f purely on a commercial uh, on a commercial basis but within that then something like the off-label approval is where we're, we have all the information all the data from the safety point of view but there may just not be the, the full um, uh, selection, if you like, of efficacy trials or efficacy data. So what we're saying there is that the type of trials or the type of work that um, other people are doing can feed into that decision. But from a, a legal point of view, the onus or the, the responsibility then is on the person using the chemical, not the chemical company, because they haven't um, supplied all the efficacy data. So I suppose... <laughs> To think about how that would work in the future, it's, it's constantly looking, looking to other member states, looking internationally to see what options there are out there, what, um, you know, maybe um, pesticides, but maybe also biologicals, etc. And looking then and researching to see, well, how will these work in an Irish context? And then we see how we can get them from a regulatory point of view. Uh, generic term for pesticides and herbicides, or are you specifically talking about insecticides, I suppose, is it? Yeah, yeah, and thank you for that, because it is something that often gets mixed up. So the term pesticides, and I'll go back to the first slide, the term pesticides basically covers all plant protection products. So we're talking about herbicides, fungicides, uh, insecticides, uh, molluscicides, etc., etc., but it also covers the biocides. So when we, you know, when we talk about it, uh, we talk about plant protection products. So it's basically any any chemical that protects the plant. So to answer your question, simply yes, we're including all those as a, yeah. It's just because the word pest, everyone associates it with a creature. Yeah. Okay. The question is in relation to we've moved a little bit away from uh, pine weevil to glyphosate. So I don't know, Anne Marie, is that something you can answer? Yeah, no. No, that, that's fine. So glyphosate, as you know, is, is a herbicide and it, um, it was reviewed at European level and had been approved, uh, for, but, but for a shorter period. Normally, um, active substances are approved possibly for a 10 year period, but in the case of glyphosate, it was shortened. Um, because of a lot of, um, issues, Perception, partly, and um, but so where we're at, at the moment is the glyphosate is currently being reviewed. So they, it's it's in it's in that process, if you like. Sorry, bear with me. It's in the middle of this process here. It's at the active substance review stage. So um, the review has been completed, and it's 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 EFSA are now gathering up all the uh, inputs, there was a, a, a public consultation. So all that information is currently being compiled by EFSA. There will be the peer review process and they then will, they will issue their evaluation. But um, just by um, the 
sorry, the European Chemical Agency are all also doing their review. So the two reviews will come together and they will then pre present their findings to the Commission and it will go then for that uh, um, decision. It should be by the end of the year. Glyphosate is due, is, um, expires, I think it's in December this year. So it has to be completed by then. And at that point then, the active substance, the glyphosate, will be approved or not, or maybe approved with restrictions, etc. And then the plant protection products containing that will then have to be reviewed at a um, national level and we'll have to take action. So whether that's removing products from the market or whether it's adding mitigation measures, we just don't know until it, it comes out. So at the end of the year is where it Okay, we've gone off yeah. script totally here now and we've moved to urea I'll, I'll, and the definition of urea from a plant protection point of view. I'll, I'll give you a general answer, which is basically that if you're using a product to, if you, sorry, if, you're, if a product is being, if we're regulating a product that says it kills something, then it is a plant protection product. So if that label says that it kills whatever, then we, it has to be evaluated as a, as a plant protection product. If you're using something as a fertilizer, it's a fertilizer. Thanks for that. Um, any other questions? More back to topic, if possible. Do we have one? Nematodes and fungi were mentioned as management of hygiene. Is it time to depart on life, life cycle of any of the birds or mammals that we know? In other words, killing the hygiene, do they have a knock on effect in any biodiversity? Okay, the question, a very relevant one there in relation to the pine weevil life cycle. Is there any other um, animal um, that would be part of the life cycle that if we did kill the pine weevil, that it would impact on their life cycle? Whether that's one of you now or Marie <laughs> I or think, else? I think that's Louise or Christina. What I would say just on the, on the using a, a, the fungicide or using a, um, a nematode, so the the micro, microorganisms are currently part of the, the regulation. So uh, there are microorganisms that are approved as active substances, as plant protection products. The biological, the, the nematodes, is something that isn't regulated from a, a plant protection point of view, and it's something that is being, in, is being looked at under the regulation as part of that farm to fork strategy. But on the life cycle and the other, I'm sorry, that's outside my... Absolutely, and I think a very relevant question, but uh, one to hold for later. Okay, an old question here. Okay, the question there in relation to off-label approval, is there a time limit on it and does it expire after a certain amount of time? Yeah, there's no, no particular time limit, but what I would say is that the plant protection product itself must be approved. So if for some reason the plant protection product that's been used in other areas um, is taken off the market, or then obviously the off-label would be removed as well. So, um, but there's no, no, no particular reason why the off-label approval itself would be removed um, uh, separately to the actual product, if, if that answers your question.